Thank you all very much. Um, so uh, I am Jesse Wolfersberger, Chief Data Officer for Merits Motivation Solutions. So uh, I'll give you the quick background for those who don't know Merits. It's kind of an interesting story. Um, so Merits is actually a 125-year-old company here in St. Louis. And it's kind of odd to be talking about AI at a 125-year-old company. But Merits' history is all about uh, change and innovation. So they actually came over as Swiss immigrants and made uh, wristwatches and jewelry. And then the Great Depression hit. And so what do you do with a whole warehouse full of jewelry and wristwatches when people don't even have jobs? Well, uh, what the Merritt's family did is they actually created the incentive industry and said, hey, whoever sells the most hats uh, will get a nice gold watch. Or when you hit your retirement age, you get this nice gold watch. So they invented the incentive industry about 100 years ago. And so we've been innovating on it ever since. And now we're all the way to AI, where we're using AI to help motivate and incent uh, customers and salespeople and employees. So I think that's kind of interesting. So I'm sure you guys have all been sitting in conference rooms much like this all day today, getting talked at about AI, which is all great. That's why we're here. But I'd like to do something a little bit different if, I'm, if I can. Let's experience some AI right now. Does that sound good? OK. How many people here have a mobile phone? OK, it's 2019. You all have mobile phones. So that was a, that was a trick question. Um, pull out your mobile phones and go to this website, or just Google the words quick draw. And let's also, if, if I can, um, go ahead and turn your sound up on your phone. Uh, go ahead and turn it on. Let's all play this together. What you're, it's going to ask you to do, it's going to give you, it's kind of a game of Pictionary. So you're going to draw what the prompt says, and the AI is going to try to guess what you were drawing before you're even done drawing it. So let's all take maybe five minutes here and see if we can do it. When you get done, let's see, I'll, we'll hear, and we'll see when people get in there yet. Anyone? Don't hear any yet. Who's there? Square, there we go. <laughs> Come on, turn your turn your sound up. Go ahead. <laughs> so you have six rounds. So when you get done with your six rounds, go ahead and like raise your hand and shout out how many you got right. Okay, who's, who's gotten their six done yet? Go ahead and just shout out. How many did you get? Or how many did it get? I got six. All six, okay. Who else? All six. So while people are finishing up here, so good. Again, let, let me know. Looks like people are still working a little bit. Anyone else get done? How many did it get? Five. Five. Four. Three. Five. OK. OK, so as we finish up here, um, I'll kind of show you the next step of this, but then I'll have to remind everybody to turn your phones off. So I, I know that I'm doing two things here. So this is kind of a fascinating use of AI. I mean, this is a game, right? It's, it's a game of Pictionary, which is you know, not very consequential, all things considered. But what is then interesting to me is what you can do with that data. So this is made by Google. And so you know, Google now has, um, th this has been out there for over a year. And so it's got just, I'm sure, millions of sketches of people drawing cats and books and whatever else it asks you to draw. And so what do you do with a data set like that where you've got a million people trying to draw a cat? Well, now you can kind of flip that on its head and say, I can predict how you're going to draw your cat. So I'm going to show you that here. So we've got a cat. And so I might start by drawing the head here. And so look what happens. The little green line says, OK, you're going to finish the cat's head and then start on the ear. And as I kind of keep going here, it's going, OK, let's finish the hat the hat, the head, right? And then it's like, oh, do the ears. And I'm like, OK, well, maybe I would do an ear here. And, my, and so and then it's like, oh, the next thing you're going to do is draw this ear. And then you can start to see like some whiskers and stuff. It's predicting my next likely moves based on the training data that we all just provided, right? 
So, um, and, and look, that doesn't, this is a really good example to me of how this stuff works because um, it doesn't mean that it has to be 100% accurate. Sure, maybe, I, maybe my cat's got one ear and I'm not gonna draw that ear. Like, it, that's okay, or maybe it's got a, you know, maybe I like my ears and my cats to be round instead of pointy, whatever. But um, for the most, for the majority, it's able to predict what the next likely moves are. So you can see whiskers and stuff, maybe I'll draw some eyes, something like that. It's really hard to do on a touchpad, you get the idea. Let's do another one, I, I, so let's do, the other one I really like is truck. So anyway, you can, you can find this stuff online on, uh, if you Google it, it's interesting. So let's do a truck here and see what happens. Loading. Okay, so if I were to draw a truck, what would I start with? A line, a line but of what? The bed, okay, so let's start with the bed here. So I'm gonna do kind of, let's do like a box truck. We'll do kind of a big, right? So it's like, okay, you're gonna finish the box truck and look how like it dynamically changes to the size I'm going for here. It's like you're gonna finish the box truck and then the next thing it's like, all right, the next thing you're gonna do is the wheel. And the wheel goes about there because that's where most people put the wheel. And you're gonna, the next thing you're gonna do is the next wheel, okay? But let's kind of scratch this for a second. Let's say I start with a wheel. Some people probably start with the wheels when they do a truck. Boy, that's a bad one. We'll do a truck, uh-oh, not safe for work. I better hurry up and finish that one, okay. <laughs> All right, so second wheel. And then it's like, okay, well the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're gonna build the box of the truck. So this is a really fascinating example to me of, you know, again, it's not, AI gets a little misnomer because it's like, you can't predict what I'm gonna do, I have free will. Yeah, that's true, but we can predict the most likely thing that you're gonna do next, okay? So I just find this interesting and I hope you guys enjoyed playing the game. Let me go back to my deck here for a second. Okay. Say again? It, it has multiple lines. I'm curious why it has multiple lines. I, I think it's just iterations. So it probably has kind of like the most likely one, but that's maybe a little bit, um, but the most likely one's probably pretty close to the second and third and fourth. So probably, I don't know, maybe kind of rotates through those or randomly shows those. Um, so while we're on the topic of art, um, I want to kind of really take a derail from, from talking about AI and, and look at some art for a second. Um, that's a good one, right? Everyone probably knows this one. There's a style of art that this is called. Impressionism. Impressionism, aha, we do have some art majors here, or at least art uh, uh, fans here. So this is, uh, Impressionism kind of fascinating to me, um, and I, I promise I'll tie this back to AI. Uh, Impressionism is kind of interesting to me because um, it's actually, sure, you know, these great artists, Monet and, and everybody else, like they, they did a great job of inventing this kind of art, but really it was a technological innovation that made this all possible. It wasn't just that one day they, they were drawing one way and they went outside and saw flower lilies and started drawing it like this. Um, there was actually a technological innovation. So art used to look, you know, this you've probably are, are more um, accustomed to seeing something like this, right? This is, this is kind of what art looked like until the age of Impressionism came along. Um, and art was like that, um, you know, for almost uh, 200 years or more than 200 years. And all of a sudden, you know, overnight or sort of in art terms overnight, um, everything changed and everything started to look like things on the right. So they went away from being super realistic and into impressionistic. So now I know in like sort of the, the digital economy, um, this doesn't seem like, uh, this seems like forever where, you know, startups kind of come up and down every day the way that the, in the world we live in now. But this, and this is like a flash in the pan in, in terms of art history. You know, you'd have, you'd have generations live and die only knowing art that looked like that. So, like I said, the thing that changed here was actually technological innovation. So it was a guy named John G. Rand, and he invented something to allow this to happen. Um, anyone, my team can't answer this because they already know the answer. Does anyone have any guesses of what the technological innovation is? Yeah. The camera, it's a very good guess, but that is actually not what I'm going for here. It is this, it is the metal paint tube. So he invented the metal paint tube, and it's one of those things where you go, I kind of always assumed it always existed, Right, like I didn't, can't even really conceive of what they carried paint in before that. Would you believe it's animal bladders? So before the metal paint tube was invented, they would actually take like a pig's bladder and they would fill it with paint. And then what you would do here is that around the top, you would actually prick it with a tack and kind of squirt out the paint that you want. And then you'd kind of put the tack back in to the same hole you did, but like, that's not a seal. That's not really gonna work. And so it's really messy and sort of, you never really can seal it right, it all dries up. So this innovation, was fantastic because all of a sudden, and we still use them today, all of a sudden, your paint won't dry out. It's resealable. So if you need a little bit of like a really unique color, that's not something you would do if you think the rest of it's gonna dry out, but if you can just seal it back up, yeah, make a little bit of that really interesting color. 
It's portable. You can actually go to where the flower lilies are, bring your paints, go draw out in the wild, not just in a studio. And you know, I don't even have to probably say, but like, it's not messy. Imagine walking around, going down to the water lilies to try to paint with a uh, pocket full of pig bladders that are all half open, right? So because of this technological innovation, it enabled these artists who, look, they would have been great. You know, Monet is going to be a great artist no matter what era he's born in, but he had access to a different tool that people before him didn't. And so that allowed him to become this great, famous artist, OK? I promised I would bring it back to AI. So here we go. AI is a metal paint tube. It is a technological innovation that we all now have access to. So it exists. It's out there. People are doing cool stuff with it. And you're the artist. And, and I, I double down on here and say, yes, even you. Like, what we need now are people who have interesting ideas of what to do with AI. So we're not asking anyone in here to be John Rand and create the AI, create the back end. Maybe some people are good at that kind of stuff. Um, but that stuff's already there. What we really need is interesting uses of AI. So I want to talk about that um, during my, most of my talk today. Um, you know, the data is everywhere. The AI, AI algorithms are essentially free. So there's not a huge barrier to entry on this. You know, imagine a world where someone like Google uh, patented AI. And in order to do AI for your business or your personal use or anything else, you had to pay them some license fee. Like, we would not be able to innovate nearly as fast in that world. But it's all free. It's out there. It's open source. So we need creativity. We need people who have interesting ideas, maybe even people who are not data scientists, not engineers. We need people who are in the businesses and you know, even outside of businesses that have interesting ideas. Okay? So um, I, I'm going to walk through that and walk, about, walk through what we, we do at Merits with it and sort of in general. Um, I, I want to have a kind of a quick aside because it, I give a lot of AI talks and it, invariably there's somebody in the audience that looks like this guy. Sometimes it's me. And, and they usually raise their hand and say, oh, you're talking about machine learning. You're not talking about AI. Or you're talking, you know, they, they get really, you know, down in the weeds and the definitions. And I think that's really unproductive for our entire industry. Um, I think that, you know, that's sort of a gatekeeping type of thing that the data scientists um, don't want the business people or don't want the creative people to come in. And so they put up these walls and they say, you don't even know what you're talking about. That's not, that's machine learning. It's like, that's completely unhelpful in my opinion. I think we should embrace the term as it is. And so my definition looks like this. Um, it's a family of algorithms of, uh, and methodologies that is always growing. So we will never get to the end of it. And this includes things like machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, computer vision, and robotics. So you know, I, again, th this is my you know, small soapbox I will get on is, is let's sort of you know, make friends um, with folks who want to get into this field. And let's not put up walls with terminologies and I know more than you kind of stuff. Can we agree on that point? OK. So, um, so how are we using AI? So how, you know, I, I will not say that we are, we are Monet's, um, but I do think we have some interesting use cases of, of what we're trying to do. So um, actually, about a year ago, I spoke at this conference, and I talked a little bit about the seeds of this program. And so now, it's a year later, we actually have this thing completed. And we've been um, all over the place, including the New York Times. You'll see my ugly mug accepting an award for this. Um, we, we won the Motivation Grandmasters Award, which for anyone outside of the incentive industry is probably like gobbledygook. But for us, it's kind of a big deal. So we're excited about it. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this project and why I think it's interesting. So um, a big part of what we do at Merits is loyalty. So if you are a member of Southwest, Marriott, Hilton, a number of other you know, hotels and, and otherwise, um, you are on one of our loyalty platforms. And so typically, um, if you earn a lot of points or even a few points uh, and you, you want to use them for room nights or merchandise or whatever you want, um, there's kind of a barrier. Um, how many people, by show of hands, know their balance of their reward points just off the top of their heads? OK, nobody. How many people have checked their reward balance, like how many points you have in, a, in your favorite loyalty program? How many have checked this week? OK, maybe like a third. So you get where I'm going for here. It's not like your bank account, where you kind of know how much is in there, um, some people maybe to the penny. Um, but this is one of those things that's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So what we thought we could do is, well, what if we could shop for people? What if we could predict what someone is likely to redeem their, their reward points for, and then kind of serve them up with that message so that they don't even have to shop? If I know that you're likely to use your points for golf clubs, well, I could just give you an email that says, hey, here's our newest golf clubs, right? Or if I know you're going to use your points to travel, 
I could say, hey, here's your points for travel, or a gift card, or even cash. So we'd say, hey, you know, we think that you know, you're someone who's gonna use your points for cash. Here you go, here's the denominations, click the button, okay? So we see this as an interesting way of predicting preferences, and instead of just sending somebody to, you know, because we all get these emails all the time, right, of like, use your reward points, or here's how to earn, or whatever, to make that more personalized and relevant, and to be able to take out the process of going to the site, figuring out, you know, is my point worth a penny? Is it worth a nickel? Is it like some kind of fraction? Like you have to do math. You're asking the consumers to do math now. That's not a great process. But if we can just kind of cut the middleman and say, here's something we think you're gonna like anyway, um, and th this, this program works great. So it, we, it worked like gangbusters. 70% of the people who redeemed through this promotion redeemed for the thing that the AI thought they would, the thing that the AI promoted to them. So this is really interesting because um, it's the, really the kind of the first nugget of where we think this whole industry is going to go, which is you know, relevant um, communications and personalized rewards and really stopping the barrier of you know, folks just like all of us who don't know what their points are worth, their points are sitting in their account. That's not good for anybody. It's not good for the consumer because the consumer doesn't get any value. It's not good for the brand because the brand wants you to redeem your points so that you remember that and you have good value of, oh, I really like Southwest or I'm, I'm really close to buying that thing with my Marriott points. We want you know, there to be some knowledge about your status and what it's, uh, what it's worth. So that's the way we use AI in kind of an interesting way, but it's not the only way we use the AI. Um, we use AI on kind of mundane things or, or maybe you know, to outside the industry mundane things every day. So uh, we would forecast market demand. Uh, one of our clients is a roofing company and so we forecasted market demand for uh, uh, roofs and something like weather is really critical when you're forecasting demand for roofs. So that's something that AI is really good at. Um, culture intelligence, so understanding the words that are used um, in your um, we have a, an employee experience platform where you can give points to, to other employees and you can put comments of, hey, great job, you know, or, or one of my teammates will say, great job at that presentation, you killed it. Hint, 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 they're shaking their heads no. Okay. Um, but you can mine that for insights about the culture of a business or even the culture of a team and say, this manager has this kind of culture, that manager has this kind of culture, just based on the, on the verbatims that are coming through there. Um, retention prediction. So, um, we, are, we do a lot of work in the automotive industry. So um, auto salespeople is a high turnover business. And if we can predict which salespeople are likely to uh, be retained and which ones are likely to burn out, we can affect that and we can try to find those who need maybe an extra nudge or an extra training to help them become successful, you know, using AI to do that in a targeted way instead of trying to do that for everybody is much more cost effective. Uh, and then similar thing with consumer purchase. So predicting consumer purchases based on their history and what their next likely product is gonna be. So none of these things um, have me, uh, me and my big head standing there accepting an award um, because this is stuff we just do every day. And I like this quote from one of the fathers of AI, John McCarthy. As soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. So you won't see uh, me running up and down the halls of merits saying we're doing AI when it's like, well, yeah, again, it's, it's okay. So, um, so my, my call to action here is to think about something like this. Um, when you undertake an AI project, um, ask yourself, is the end user's experience better because of AI or is it just more efficient for you? So the same way that, you know, when I, when I talked about the, the HSBC program with pr the points prediction, we could have very easily um, turned that into something of optimizing click-through rate or optimizing conversion rate, something like that, which is fine, those are, those are okay, but we're much more interested in making the experience better. I, I want that person to feel like their card knows them. I want that person to feel like the card is taking steps, you know, making their, their uh, whole life a little bit easier, making that, that uh, frictionless experience with their card. We want it to feel that way. So, you know, make that person's life better. Don't just make it, don't just try to save a few bucks on um, better targeting or something like that. I mean, that, all that stuff's gonna happen too, but that's not the Monet. You know, the Monet is, not just you know, using um, better tools to do the same thing, not just using the metal paint tube to, say, to paint the same type of things you always painted, and maybe it's a little bit more efficient. No one's gonna remember if you know, that campaign that you ran or that business process um, is 10% is more efficient. I mean, that stuff's valuable too, don't get me wrong, but um, that's not what people are gonna you know, remember in 10 years. They're gonna think about the really cool AI uses. You know, think about 
the Jetsons or Minority Report or your kind of favorite, you know, futuristic uh, fiction. They, no one watched the Jetsons and said, man, I bet their like, supply chain is super efficient because of AI. No, they thought about like Rosie the, the, the robot and they thought about the, the flying cars and stuff like that. So that, that's kind of my passion. Um, here's an example that I like. I'll give everybody just a second to read this while I get a drink. Right, so, so this is kind of the negative case of what I'm talking about. This is an algorithm which attempts to maximize, like right, the, the, if you can kind of, I, I, I don't have insight into the Amazon back end, but if you think about what this algorithm that they are doing is trying to do, it's maximize you know, purchase habits. It's not saying fix this person's problem or give them, um, recommend a product that they may like next. It's saying maximize the return visits, maximize the dollars. Um, which again, we're, we're going to do some part of that, but what happens when you do that is you get stuff like this where you, you get these, I'm not sure, this is an edge case, but um, I would think that a algorithm that is um, designed a little bit better and designed for a different use would actually say something like, you know, all right, if this person needs a toilet seat, what else might they need? Are they renovating their bathroom? You know, what, what else do they need? And give them something that's going to make their life 10% better, not just make your back end 10% better. Am I making sense? Okay. So here's some cool, that, that's a kind of a negative example. Here's some positive examples. Here's some companies I think are doing it right. So Stitch Fix, um, for those uh, who may not know it, it's a subscription box. So every month um, you get a box of clothes and it's kind of this awesome hybrid between consumer choice and AI uh, preferences. So you go, when you sign up for Stitch Fix, um, you kind of rate different clothes and say, yeah, I'd wear that. No, I wouldn't wear that. Yeah, that's my style. No, that's not. But you can't rate every single thing in their catalog, right? So it uses that, it, it uses the few um, preferences that you've expressed and matches that up to their back end and then starts giving you clothes that it thinks you will like. Um, what's even better is it gives you clothes that it thinks you will fit, right? So you can say, when you get one of these shirts, now I feel like secretly judged like people are like looking at my clothes like, oh, all right, guy, all right. But you can say, oh, these sleeves are too long, these sleeves are too short, and it kind of builds that into the algorithm so that it, you know, it knows how that brand of shirt fits you now. Um, so you know, this is a, a good example of using AI to make my life better, not necessarily give me the cheapest clothes possible. Um, here's another interesting one. So I got this reminder one day, I dropped my daughter off at school, and then pulled up ways to see how the traffic was going to work, and it said, um, Hey, do you, would you like to set a reminder to check your car once you get to your destination? So now, there's kind of a, a, a dark context here, which is you know, obviously um, leaving kids in the car, but the, the fact of the matter is this happens in the US like every year you read a story about this. So what Waze could have done is said, um, hey, I see that you clearly have, so now it's got a signal that I have a kid, right? Because I dropped, you know, I was at school, I made a stop. It could give me ads for toys or diapers or clothes or whatever. It's trying to make my life a little bit better, maybe a lot better, right? It's saying, you know, you know maybe you don't do or do not need this reminder, but it, there's no doubt in my mind that this is an interesting use of using AI to try to make my experience better, try to make my life better. This is, again, this is Monet. This is, I can do this, and I, I did not have the ability to do this before because I did not have the computing technology to do it, but now that I can, what am I going to do with it? And you could try to sell me um, new car seats or new baby clothes, but instead you're trying to make my life a little bit better. I think that's interesting. Here's another interesting one. I'll read this because it's a little bit small. So we went out to a wedding one night, had a few too many uh, drinks, and the next morning I get this on my Fitbit. Um, it says, alcohol is a negative effect on the amount of REM sleep you get. That sleep stage helped you really blah, blah, blah. So again, so now think about the back end of this for a second. It knows that I was drinking last night. That's a pretty interesting signal, something that we could never have had before AI. Um, now, what do you do with it? You know, I don't think this is maybe the peak use of this, just letting me know, yeah, I know that I don't sleep well when I drink, okay, like newsflash. But um, I think it's an interesting kind of, um, you know, first step towards something more interesting. It's a first step towards, okay, if you know this about me, you know the signal here that I was drinking last night, can you order some Postmates biscuits and gravy to my house? That'd be pretty nice. You know, something like that would be a little bit better. But anyway, I just think it's an interesting signal. Uh, I'll give you one more. 
Um, so I'm a huge fan of Google Photos. The two companies that need to start paying me when I do these talks, Google's one stitch fixes the other one. So I'll give you my Google Photos spiel here. Um, so this is, this is my eldest daughter. We went to the carousel at the mall one day. Um, and so this collage was made by Google Photos for me. So when I logged into Google Photos, the, the folks who have Google Photos are like, duh, at this point. But I, I give this for folks who maybe haven't seen it. It made this collage for me. So it understood that these photos were taken in the same context. It laid them out in you know, a mostly interesting way, probably the same or better as I would do it anyway. And it did this step for me. So instead, you know, sure, are there, are there a million programs out on the web that can make collages for you? Yeah, there are, but it proactively saved me time. So the, the same way that I'm trying to, to do the same thing at Merits, we're trying to save you time of what you're gonna do with your points. It did the same thing with photos. I think it's pretty interesting. Here's another example. So Google Photos, um, it noticed that I took a, a, a photo with my buddy Jeff. So it recognized his face and said, send this photo to Jeff. That's pretty interesting. So it recognized the face and it's giving me the notification. Again, could I have sent this photo to Jeff on my own? Absolutely. Maybe I would or maybe I didn't, but, or maybe I wouldn't, but the idea of having it being a one, a one push um, frictionless thing is a pretty interesting use of AI. Um, and I think that's cool. So, so last one, and I think this is, this is kind of fascinating to me. So this is my other daughter at a birthday party and she's doing a slide um, on the bounce house. So again, this, was, this is from uh, Google Photos. I took a, like a two minute video of her doing this, running up and down several times, and, and I get a notification that says, hey, we've made a new gift for you. And so think, let's, let's kind of unpack how this gift came to be for a second, because for, for some of you who my wife would fall in this category, she's like, this is boring, don't talk to me about this. But for the data nerds in the room, this is kind of an interesting kind of step here. So, of the two minute video, it took kind of the most interesting like 30 seconds or less, 15 seconds maybe, right? It then had to, what do you notice about the speed? Right, when does it increase and when does it decrease? Right, so it understands that the interesting part about this video is her going down and it speeds up when she goes back up. Right? If it didn't know that, if it didn't know that this was a slide and it just created a GIF out of action, it would be going the same speed up and down. Or maybe halfway through it would, it would go faster or, or, or slow. But it exactly knows when she's going up and when she's going down. So in order for that to be true, it takes a two minute video, finds the most interesting clip, understands that it's a slide, and then affects the GIF to make it the best GIF it can be. That's a pretty interesting sequence, sequence of events. And, and again, on my soapbox of using AI to make your product better, right? Google Photos is now a better, a better product for me because they're using AI in the background. They could have just as easily, again, you know I've got kids, hey, birthday party? Like, here's an ad about birthday parties. They could have easily tried to turn this into a short-term dollar, and maybe they are with some ad targeting or something, but they're giving me this for free. Um, you know, I, I think Apple would have been like, would you like a dollar for the premium photo package? Like, I think Google's doing kind of some interesting stuff here. So, um, so, so is that interesting or do you guys fall in the category of my wife where she's like, shut up already? Okay, I see some nods either way. Okay, um, so, so that's kind of uh, my rant about how I think we should use this stuff for good. Um, I, I wanna give you guys uh, six questions uh, to take back to your companies and start to think about how we're gonna use AI. And, and for the folks, the note takers and, and the, the photo uh, people who take photo slides, Great stuff, I've done you a favor. At the end of all of this, I've put them all on the same page, so you don't have to try to like take pictures as we go. I will give you the summary page at the end. You can take a photo, okay. So question number, number one is the thing we just talked about. How will you use AI to improve the lives of your customers? I think that's the most important question. That's what I've spent the first half of this talk talking about. You know, if, if we're sitting here talking about supply chain and you know, media optimization, that's all important stuff. That is not gonna change the world. That is not gonna change your business that's not gonna defend you from the two guys in a garage somewhere who are building a startup to disrupt your company, okay? The stuff that's gonna be really interesting is using AI to really, um, you know, again, beat up Monet, do something that you could not have done before. Uh, I will put a bullet on that point with my little stupid Drake meme here. Uh, yeah, don't use AI to squeeze margin, use it to increase utility. Okay, a couple of giggles, that's good. Thank you. Okay, so question number two, does your data play well together? So this is really important. Um, as mentioned in my bio, I'm a, I'm a big baseball nerd. 
Um, and so, you know, when you, when you Google like AI, um, as I'm sure you've seen in presentations today, I guess AI is like a big blue robot. Is that true? I'm not sure. Um, what if I told you that the real AI uh, was, was this? Right, this is the real AI. It, it, you have to have a user ID that you can track people across touch points. Otherwise, you will never get these in the end streaming things where you know I can go to my hotel and it's already checked me in, and I go to my room and um, you know it's got the bed um, you know untucked the way I like it, and it's got my favorite drink on the table. In order for it to do all these things, you have to have um, you know a, a user ID that can track me across these. So I mentioned I was a baseball nerd. You know, just, here's my kind of thought experiment for for why this is important. So let's say Mike Trout, um, when he's playing on the road, his user ID is Mike.Trout27. Let's say that's true. And then when he plays at home, um, he's TroutM27. Does this sound familiar to anyone who's got user IDs out there, right? Like the common key, so to the AI or to any analytics you're trying to do, these are two different people. So this is a big problem um, and, and something that if you have not already put a lot of thought and effort into, I would definitely recommend. Question number three, what software are you picking? So um, I'm going to give you a little, um, a little hint here, a little, a little secret here, which is that the best machine learning AI is being done with free software. So that does not mean that you, everything is free. Data storage is not free. Data compute is not free. But for the most part, um, the algorithms are all out there and free. Again, that's, that is a really awesome world to live in when that's the case. And this stuff is not, you have to buy a license um, to, ex to access you know, uh, a regression tree or a neural network, all the stuff's out there. I, I will again get in my soapbox. If there's anyone from IBM here, I apologize. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that I think gives the field a little bit of a bad name. Um, and I think it's been brought up in several sessions I've been in already, how they've kind of dropped the ball on some of the cancer stuff that they, they promised. Um, that would be, that's bad times if you're at, at IBM. Um, you know, but what they do have is a really cool commercial with Bob Dylan, right? So <laughs> this is the marketing, they, and they won Jeopardy, right? Which is all good. but. Um, you know, you don't need the Bob Dylan and, and Watson to do AI. You just need data scientists who know how to write a little bit of R or Python. Um, I can prove this to be true. I think, I, I go, you know, I think with this crowd, they probably get it. But some folks, you know, kind of roll their eyes at that and think that AI must be expensive because it's so important, right? How can it not be? Um, well, for those who have heard of Kaggle, um, Kaggle is like the major leagues of data science. Oh, I just said that. Um, it's got real data, and it's real, real problems, and there's real money involved. So there's no reason why um, the best, you know, if Watson was so good, it would go out and win all of the Kaggle competitions and make a lot of money. Um, it does not do that. 100% uh, of every Kaggle competition is won by R or Python. So, and those are both 100% open source and free. So again, I'm not suggesting that everything you do in AI is free. Um, there's still costs along the way. But um, those costs are very uh, cheap as compared to the impact that this stuff can have. So question number four, um, who is your data science team? So um, I've got some options for you. Um, here's, here's kind of a data point to take in. I'm not going to read this whole thing. But um, according to Glassdoor, the top 50 jobs in America, data scientists um, started at number nine and then has been number one three years straight. So that's great news for all the data scientists in the room. Um, and I can tell you from first-hand experience, it is hard to find them, it is hard to keep them, um, but they're very valuable if you get good ones. So um, that's, that's the kind of stakes we're in. So I think that kind of leads to three options um, as far as I'm concerned. So three options, here you go. Option number one, you can bite the bullet and you can hire expensive data scientists if you can even find them. I think that's, that's an option. Um, option number two is you could buy expensive software and then realize you still need to hire the data scientists. Um, or option number three, you can partner with people who know what they're doing. So um, I, I have my preference as an agency. I would prefer option number three, and we're open for business if anyone wants to come say hi. But I also don't you know, knock anybody who wants to do option number one as well. That, that's a smart way to go, too. Um, I would say the only one here that I would not recommend is option number two. So no, no matter what you get on your, uh, on your inbox, no matter what you see on your, your uh, you know, LinkedIn messages or whatever, there's not an AI button. There's no one that's going to be able to come in and just hit the button and do AI for your business. It's not going to be, even if they can, they're not going to be customized to your business. You're going to need some tuning. You're going to need to find, what's the use case? Again, they might be able to come in and do some basic stuff for you, but it's, they're not going to paint a Monet for you. So you really have to have people either you know, partner with people or have people internally who know what they're doing. Okay, so that's question number four. Question number five. So you have your goal. 
you have your data, you have your software, you have your team, um, are you sure you need AI? So that's kind of an interesting question too. I'll give you another kind of secret hint here, which is for a whole bunch of data projects, machine learning isn't better than college level statistics, okay? So, um, you know, you see a lot of stuff like this. I love the, you know, again, another Google image search uh, for deep learning, for example. Apparently deep learning is a blue head that's exploding, I don't know. Um, you probably don't need deep learning. Now again, I, I can't say that with 100% accuracy, but you probably don't. Um, if, if you are using images, video, or audio, those would be good spots to think about deep learning, but if you have what's known as tabular data, if you just have data, if you've got a user ID and sales on day one, sales on day two, whatever, deep learning is not gonna be better um, than, you know, than some of the more basic machine learning algorithms, and it might not even be better than summary statistics and sort of uh, you know, linear regressions. So again, that's something that um, a data scientist, either as a partner or an internal person, will be able to tell you, but that company that's trying to sell you a, a turnkey AI solution probably won't let you know. Okay, uh, question number six. Is your organization ready for the implications? So this is kind of a big one, so I wanna talk a little bit about this. You know, this is, this is my favorite example, I, I love this. Man, what an artifact that is, right? <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, tweet us while you're leaving Netflix. Good luck, Blockbuster. Um, but, you know, I think it's kind of a, it, it is pretty standard to have um, every, like, tech person conference ever has a logo, has a slide that has these logos on it, right? That sometimes they put them in a graveyard or whatever else. These are kind of like, you know, the companies that didn't get it, right? Or these are the companies that, um, you know, were too dumb to see what's going on. I actually have a little bit of a different take on this. Um, if you read about any of these companies and what happened with them, so Kodak with the digital camera and Xerox with a personal computer, Walkman with the, with the iPod, and of course, Blockbuster and Netflix, um, they all did see the future coming. They had chances. They had chances to acquire these companies. They, they, a lot of times they invented these things first. Kodak invented the digital camera first, um, but they didn't want to disrupt their business model. What they did not have is the appetite for bold change. Okay, so I, again, I don't paint these companies at, with the brush of, oh, they're dumb or they didn't know what they're doing. Um, I think they made some mistakes, but it's not like they didn't see it coming. It's not like they were blindsided by this stuff. And in fact, a lot of times they invented this stuff, um, but they did not have the foresight to really make a bold change. So this is, again, this is a big one. This is management level stuff. If your C-level folks don't get this and they're not into AI and they don't understand how, if they don't think their business is gonna be, you know, drastically different in the next five to 10 years, if they think their business is gonna be, oh, maybe it'll be 10% different, um, you need to kind of push them on that and you need to, again, come up with those use cases that change their mind because I think our businesses in general are gonna be much, much different in the next five to 10 years and the folks who think there's a little bit of change just like Blockbuster thinking, yeah, tweet us while you're leaving Netflix. You don't wanna be that. Okay, so I promised that I would put these on the same slide, so this is a good time for folks who wanna take a picture. And I've underlined the first one because I spent the most time on it, and I honestly think this is the most critical question. The rest of the stuff is, is very, it's almost details. If you understand what you wanna do with AI and how it's gonna change the lives of your end users, you can figure out how to get the data right, you can figure out the right data team, you can figure all this stuff out, uh, but you really have to have that North Star, you have to have that thing that's gonna change your business. Um, that's the key. I see a couple cameras left, I'm gonna wait, I don't wanna, okay, there we go. Okay, how am I doing? Good? Okay, so I've got, how much time do I got left? Uh, About 10 minutes, okay. I'm gonna run through, I, I, I kind of had this last section at the end that was kind of, depends on how fast I go. Um, I'm gonna run through it and then we can take a few questions. So this stuff is sort of not related to, you know, anything I've talked about today, this is, you know, time for something completely different. Uh, but I just want to give you guys a sense of some AI stuff that I'm keeping my eye on I think is pretty interesting and, and maybe you guys could take back as interesting examples. Okay, um, so Lyft, Postmates, Seamless, Uber, um, the, the sort of sharing economy I think is really interesting. And so we're seeing, I, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on this because this is the first time that actual humans have algorithmic bosses. Your boss tells you where to go, who to pick up, um, it tells you how much you're gonna be paid. And so there's some interesting dynamics to this. So um, over 70% of the on-demand workers use two or more apps at the same time. And I'm sure you guys have all seen this. If any Ubers ever picked you up, they usually have the Lyft sticker in the window too. So 
you have like three or four different bosses that you're working for at any given time, and you're going to go to the one that's going to pay you the most. So on the one hand, as, as an economist, I think that's kind of fascinating because it's like this true economy of wherever uh, my, value, my work is needed the most, I will go get paid the most for it. So that's great. But what happens if um, you, you know, what happens to your loyalty or to your company, right? You probably don't have it. If you're working for four companies at the same time, you probably don't have loyalty. What happens to you, you know, your kind of rights as a worker? These are all things I'm kind of interested in. Um, also, you know, we start to see the humans kind of push back against their algorithmic bosses, and I think this is going to be an interesting dynamic to watch over the next few years. So one of the things that people do when they drive for Uber or Lyft, if they go to a neighborhood that they don't want to pick up, they, they turn off their phone. They turn off their, their Lyft app or their Uber app, and they wait till they get to a nicer area, and then turn it back on. So from an algorithmic perspective, that's kind of a problem, right? Because the algorithm just sees them go off. They don't really understand why. And so it's maybe harder to get folks to drive from certain areas. Uh, another thing that happened, um, this was in the UK. Um, the drivers all got together, and they did this kind of um, interesting thing where they coordinated a mass off. So they all turned off their Uber apps at the same time. So what did, what did that do? It triggered the surge pricing because the algorithm noticed that there weren't enough drivers on the road, so it wanted to get more people on the road, so it triggered the surge pricing. So then they all turned it back on, and they all got surge pricing for the next hour. Right? So this is an interesting space of like humans are trying to do this, and they're trying to outsmart the algorithm. The algorithm is trying to maximize what it's trying to do. Fascinating. Um, OK, here's another website. Let me pop out and do this one real quick. Has anyone seen this yet? The, um, the uh, AI faces, this person does not exist.com. So what this does is it generates a face on demand. Every time you refresh the page, it actually generates a face. So all of these people, this is not a real person. This is an AI generated face. Um, using a neural network. Um, looks like a politician, maybe. <laughs> now, if we're lucky here, we'll get kind of a weird one. Uh, so, like, look at the hat. So sometimes the, the accessories, the hat, and the people in the background um, sometimes end up looking kind of weird. Oh, here you go. This will be weird. Yeah, like, what's going on over here? <laughs> no idea. That's terrifying. I'm not going to sleep tonight. Okay. You guys get the idea. So this is a, this, the website's called thispersondoesnotexist.com. Um, I, I think it's just kind of, it's, it's shocking at how good it's getting at these things that um, we never thought um, it would get good at. OK, a couple more, and then I'll take some questions here. OK, um, StarCraft. So maybe people may have seen this before. Um, so you know, for a long time, it was, oh, AI will never beat someone at chess. It'll never, never beat the best chess player in the world. And then once it did that, oh, it'll never beat the best Go player in the world. And Go is this Asian board game that's like, you know, exponentially more complex than chess. And it did that. And then now it's like, well, it'll never beat uh, a, the best human players at StarCraft. Because StarCraft is an online video game. And it does, it, it takes planning. And it t it's, it's, it's a big board with unlimited number of pieces and moves. It's not like Go or chess where there's a defined number of options. Um, so this is kind of fascinating. So AlphaStar is uh, a Google company. And so for the first time, so this, is, this is actually what it looks like in the back end. These are um, re representations of what the AI is seeing. So you've got things like what it's trying to build and what its outcome prediction is. Um, and so it's, it has not yet beat the best human players, but it has beat some professionals. So this is kind of a fascinating thing. And the thing that I'm most interested in is this. So um, the human chess player, or the human chess, the human StarCraft players are best known for their reaction times. And they're best known for actions per minute, APMs. So if you look at this guy's left hand, this is a pro. I mean, it's, it's like superhuman you know, actions per minute. And the best ones are just crazy. And, and so when I first read this article about um, the AI beating the best StarCraft player, or beating some StarCraft players, I thought, well, yeah, that's kind of dumb. Like, of course it can. Computers can do things faster than us. So th there's no question it's going to be able to do this. But what happened is interesting. Um, it actually moves slower. So it had less actions per minute than the two human players. So Alpha Star's in the blue, and the other two are pro humans. Um, it actually did less actions per minute because it was more precise and it actually understood the strategy of the game better than the humans could. So I was shocked to learn that. It was not just sort of um, you know, uh, raw power uh, that did it, or, or raw horsepower. It was actually intelligence. So it's kind of fascinating. Um, so I think this is my last one here, and I'll kind of end here. People may have seen this too, but this is just really fascinating to me. I'm going to go ahead and play this. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. 
So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So yeah, I think you guys kind of noticed, but like the most interesting part in that, right, is the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. So, so, um, so I will leave you with this, which is, um, Let's, let's make a pact here between us to use AI, uh, not to just make things 10% better, but let's use it to do things that were never possible before. So AI has never been able to make a human um, conversation before, so let's use it to do that, not just kind of make all of our little processes 10% better. That's not gonna change the world, but stuff like this is, okay? With that, I will say go paint. Thank you. We have some microphones for questions. Hello. Uh, over the course of time with you guys integrating AI into your business, what's been the, uh, the biggest challenge you've had culturally with your staff uh, getting up to speed? It is a fantastic question. So um, I have some answers for you, but I will say that you know, I'm not going to stand here and say we've got it 100% figured out either. Uh, when we do things like we did with the HSPC example and we're trying to predict reward points, we got a lot of our operations staff and our salespeople and our marketing, I mean, everyone who's involved in getting this whole project together, we had to explain what this was to them like a thousand times and explain, hey, why is this important? What do you mean? How does it pick like that? What do you, what do you mean the computer knows? what I'm, I mean, we had a lot of conversations like that. And so, um, which is fine. That's what I would say. Number one, you might have to explain stuff a lot, and that's just part of the job. Number two is we had to make it an expectation that this was not siloed. It can't just be, hey, the data science folks know how to do this, and you guys just continue on with your day job. No, you have to, under, you have to be able to have like the one-foot depth conversation with our clients about what this is. And if they start asking deep-level questions, okay, one of the data scientists will get on the phone and, and answer these 10-foot depth questions. But you, you cannot just kind of sit back and say, oh, that's not my department. We all have to understand how to use these vocabulary terms. And again, the thing, AI and machine learning, all that stuff is stuff I've done internally to say, it's okay for you to say AI, and here's why. Here's what machine learning is. Here's what deep learning is. We have to educate the whole, um, the whole company on what this stuff is. Not everyone needs to be able to write our code, but they have to be able to kind of have these conversations. So a great presentation, really. really Thank you. a good job, appreciate it. Um, so there's a big question for um, on our side. When when you have a lot of people said, okay, I, I want to have these new things and I want to I want to have this technology, and then how are we going to bring along the other half of the people who say I don't want you watching that I was drinking last night, or I, I don't right. want you, you know, sending me different things. How are how are we going to really solve that? It's a great question. I think a lot of times, like when I when I play the Google video too, a lot of and maybe in, in this room too, I, I'd say probably less so than most because it's an AI conference, but there's a little trepidation of, that's a little creepy, right? Um, I think those are questions and discussions that we need to have, and we just have to put them out in the open. What I will say is that in terms of privacy and sort of um, you know, the creepiness of this stuff, I think that's a generational question that you know, I'm glad that we're having it here, but I don't think our kids will ever have. I don't think that our kids are gonna grow up with this stuff, they're never gonna ask why, you know, it, it would be like when you grow up saying, hey, why is there a commercial between this show? It, you just grew up with it, you just, commercials are in between shows, it's just what it is. Um, so that being said, I don't think we should wave our hands over it and not address it. Um, we did a study on our reward site where we did a, an A-B test of, we recommend products the same way Amazon does, and so one of the, the A test was recommended for you, and the B test was recommended for you based on clicks on this website. So the transparency 
Um, and that one did better. So the, the transparency did better. So I think transparency where we can, um, but also like in my example of promoting golf clubs to you, um, you know, if it's a relevant email and just says, oh, I like golf clubs, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how much I care. So these are things that we're definitely talking about, and I think that we need to you know, make sure we don't brush it to the side. Um, but I think transparency is going to be key, and then um, also just you know, making sure that there's a lot of permissions and, and ways to opt out. Those are all you know, critical. Maybe out of time? Do we have time for one more? What do you think? OK, time for one more, if anyone's got one. Or I mean, look, people ask me about baseball all the time, too. That's, that's OK. I'm just curious if there are any other examples of kind of democratizing AI to, um, for people who may be getting these AI features and, and concepts, I guess, to the normal person. So like the, the um, sketch activity, that's a way for people to think about, okay, this is AI, it's more approachable. Other examples like that to kind of allow people to kind of step into this new big world that's kind of unknown. Yeah, so th that, that whole game that I've done with you guys, I've done that internally several times. Uh, we've done it over lunch and learns. We've had special um, meetups for our company to come. Hey, everyone in the whole company is invited. Come talk AI. And we, do, we play games and stuff like that because that's the way to get people in. And we talk a lot about Google Assistant and Siri and you know, the, the things that people kind of know are AI. And even Watson, I've kind of bashed Watson in sort of its use. But there's no doubt that you know, it winning Jeopardy was kind of a big step and a big public you know, kind of a pop culture way to get AI out there. So I, I do applaud that. Um, so I think those kinds of things of tying it to the things that people know, um, you know, that's kind of not scary. AI, the big blue robot, is scary. The you know the articles about AI taking our jobs and Elon Musk saying it's coming, you know, it's gonna you know rule the world. That stuff's scary. But if I can say, you know, what do you mean? I say, hey Siri, and my phone pops up. Like that's not scary because it's kind of you're used to it. So I would recommend kind of going to things people know and then saying, well, we're kind of doing that, but with this. Um, and then again, playing games and stuff like that. Um, that website, um, Amazon, um, or Amazon, it's uh, AI experiments with Google or Google AI experiments, some combination of that, actually has a whole bunch of stuff like that. I think that's the best one, but it's got a whole bunch of stuff like that. And those can be great icebreakers for either um, you know, clients or partners or, or coworkers who maybe you know, don't know anything about AI and want to experience it. So good question. I think we are out of time. Thank you very much.